Hello everyone. Welcome to the lab five of advanced embedded logic design winter 2022 semester. In this lab, we will focus on how to enable the interrupts in the zinc SOC. So before that, we will understand the, the importance of the interrupts in the embedded system and what are the different features in the interrupt which can be used in our application. Now, to begin with, let's start with a simple example of an embedded system, uh, for, which is deployed for the office security purpose. So assume that you have the embedded system where you are uh, having the different uh, cameras, different kind of sensors, fire sensors, temperature sensors, and which sends the data to the processor. That means the processor needs to upload this data at a regular interval on some cloud. Assuming that the processor is doing all the data uploading by its own without the use of the DM. And say that the emergency event has happened. In that case, since the processor is busy with the data uploading task, processor may not have time to look at this event, uh, emergency event. It may look it at after a certain time, which, which may be significantly longer. So in this case, how we should inform the processor that there is an emergency event and its attention is needed. And for that, we use the interrupt. So the interrupt is a signal which is generated to indicate to the processor that its attention is required. Interrupts are generated as a specific response to the event. So you can generate the interrupt for any task, but, but the interrupt should be used carefully and they should be generated only when there is a specific events are there, which are very critical events. Interrupts can be generated by the different units in the SOC. You have the hardware processing unit, so you may have the different accelerators inside the FPJ. Those you can use to generate the interrupt. Your DMA can generate the interrupt. For example, in case of the DMA, it can generate the interrupt when it completes the um, memory transfer to the data transfer to the uh, FFT, as well as when it receives the data from the FFT. Your peripherals can generate the interrupt. For example, when Ethernet receives the one packet of data, it can generate the interrupt to tell the processor that I have received the new packet of data. Uh, you should take care of the processing. Within the software, within the processing system also, you can have the different units which can generate the interrupt. For example, you may have the timers. This uh, can generate the interrupt. You may have the watchdog timer. For example, watchdog timers are used in the embedded system to make sure that the, the your system doesn't get hanged. So these watchdog time, timers are the free running timers. So they start with certain higher value and they keep on counting down. Uh, after, at the regular interval, the watchdog timer should uh, get some kind of indication from the processor that processor is running fine. One such indication is received from the processor, watchdog timer will reset itself to the maximum value. Now, when the processor gets hanged, that means in that case, the indication from the processor will not be received at the watchdog timer. So watchdog timer will keep on counting down and when it receives, when it goes to the lowest value, the watchdog timer will generate a reset to the entire system. Your system will get resetted, which means that your processor will come out of that hang state automatically. Okay, so these are the uh, interrupts can be used. Then if you want to, uh, uh, if you have the multiple core uh, system, then one core can send the interrupt to the another core. So interrupts can be internally generated, like whenever you are doing the divide by zero, interrupt can be generated. When you are decoding the instruction, but the instruction is illegal, then the interrupt can be generated. There can be uh, externally generated interrupt, like you have the data arrived on the peripherals or the, uh, your accelerator has completed the task. In that case, you can generate the interrupt. All the interrupts can be generated synchronously 
or asynchronously. That means they can be generated at any time, but their processing will start asynchronously. Their processing will start start only synchronously. So what does it mean? Suppose that this is the clock. Okay. So in this case, you can see that the suppose that the interrupt is generated at this point, the processor will start the processing only at the next positive edge. So that means the there will be some uh, non-zero delay between the interrupt is received and its processing is uh, being it is started being processed by the processor. So in our lab, we have used the timer to measure the execution time of the FFT on the processor as well as the, on the FPJ. So they are quite uh, uh, widely used to measure the uh, execution time. Now in certain application, you may want to, uh, uh, you may want to measure the time interval. For example, you may want to know uh, every time when the one millisecond has been elapsed. So you want to receive a, uh, uh, some indication that okay one second has been elapsed for example if you are developing a clock you want uh, to increase the your second counter at every one one second or for example you want to add a delay of one millisecond in your code how to do that one option is that you can use the for loop for example you can use the for loop which say that i is equal to zero i is less than say n and i plus plus and this is the empty for and by using some empirical observation you can choose the value of n that will give you the total delay of say one millisecond but this is not an accurate one because at the end your for loop is nothing but the set of instruction and sometimes some instruction may be executed faster sometimes some instruction may be executed slower so it it uh, it uh, indicate that this way of developing the delay may not be accurate but how about using the some interrupt some interrupt uh, based timer where this timer will send the signal whenever the 1 millisecond has elapsed then you don't need to worry about uh, uh, this for loop and empirically observing. You know that the timer is going to send me the signal which indicate that the one select second has been uh, one millisecond has been elapsed from your previous signal. So in this case, you can see that the uh, uh, we can solve the issue of the accuracy of the generating that delay. But there are two ways of using the timer either by using the polling mode or by using the interrupt mode. In case of the polling mode, you, you will keep on checking the value of the timer to see that whether the one second has been, one millisecond has been elapsed or not. Or in case of the interrupt mode, you will receive the uh, signal from the timer to indicate that the one millisecond has been elapsed. So in that case, you can say that the interrupt mode is better than the polling mode because you don't need to keep on pulling the time. So, so we, we can avoid this uh, polling mode, which is inefficient. So we can make use of the interrupt, okay? So interrupt will cause a change in the program flow because whenever the interrupt is received by the processor, processor needs to understand who has sent the interrupt and what action need to be taken when that uh, to process that interrupt. So interrupt will cause a change in the program flow. First, the normal program flow is completed. You, the processor will complete the current instruction, which is the ongoing instruction. Then processor will make the necessary things, uh, will store the data so that the after the interrupt is processing, processor can come back to the normal program flow. So then processor will decide uh, what specific code to be executed uh, to process that particular interrupt after that specific code is called as the interrupt service routine that will be called and when the interrupt service routine is done you will come back to your normal program flow okay so this is how the interrupts are processed inside the processor 
So let's quickly summarize our discussion on interrupts and how the interrupts are differed with respect to the polling. So interrupts are the signals which are generated to indicate to the tell the processor that its attention is required. They are generated as a specific response as a response to the specific events. Now, what is the difference between the polling and the interrupt? So in our lab, till now, we have used the polling. So what is this polling is, for example, in our lab, when we do the DMA, simple transfer, what we are doing, we are continuously checking status register of the DMA. to see that whether that ideal bit is set or not. So this is called as a polling and this leads to a lot of time wastage because you need to, when you are trading from the status register in the DMA at a regular interval, that means you are generating the AXI read transaction and which will take some time. And this leads to the inefficient use of your resources because the, the processor has to do this task. So in the polling, Processor synchronously samples the device status by software program. So it does it at the regular interval like we did in case of the DM. Processor needs to check each and each input and output device periodically to see that if that device needed attention. In our case, we are using only DMA, but if suppose we use the multiple peripherals, then processor has to do this task for every peripheral. And if it is done in the time sharing fashion, then it may happen that the, uh, the processor will take a lot of time to look at the particular device. But instead of this, can we use the interrupt which will allow the device to inform the processor that its attention is needed? So in that case, the processor doesn't need to go out to each device and ask for that device. In this case, we know that the device is going to tell the processor when its attention is needed. This will help us to for the processor to save time to go in the round 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 robin round fashion to all the uh, devices. Also, during that time, processor can do other important tasks, which are something more useful. So, processor can continue with its own task, and processor knows that whenever someone needs its attention, that device will send the uh, appropriate interrupt signal, and at that time, I can respond to that device. So use of interrupts lead to the improvement in the throughput and allows the processor to handle the peripherals in the most efficient manner, okay? So why the uh, improvement in the throughput? Because now, because the processor doesn't need to do this round robin task of asking the device to whether you need its uh, attention. It will, instead of that, processor can continue implementing, it, uh, uh, implementing its own task uh, we, without uh, delaying it. Also, here the allows the processor to handle the peripherals in the most efficient manner. So on the device side also, the number of read requests from the status register will be reduced. So this will also lead to the uh, better utilization of the peripherals. So this is same as our telephone system. For example, in a telephone system, if we don't have the ring option, in that case, that every regular interval, we need to go to that, uh, we need to open, uh, uh, we need to pick up the telephone and see someone is calling or not. So because of the ring, we don't need to ring option. We don't need to pick up the telephone every time. We, we know that whenever someone is calling me, I'm going to, uh, I, either there will be a ring option and I'm going to pick up the phone only during that time. So that means uh, I can do my own tasks without going to the telephone and picking, the, picking it up at the regular interval. So that's a uh, big advantage. Another advantage is that the possibility of missing the particular event is less in case of the interrupt. For again, going back to the telephone example, it, it is high, uh, there is a high probability that you will miss some call if there is no ring signal. Similarly, in case of the round robin fashion, it may happen that the one particular device is needing its attention, but it's uh, 
it's uh, uh, it is not it's a, uh, uh, the it is its position in the queue is subsequently far away so that means that event it will not get the processor attention and the subsequent uh, failure or the error condition might happen so that is the another important thing which can be avoided using the interrupt so there are different types of interrupt there can be a maskable interrupt the maskable interrupts means these interrupts may not be important at all the time sometimes they may be important sometimes they may not be important so the trigger event of the mask interrupt is not always important it is the task of the programmer to decide whether the event should cause the program to jump to the requested execution or not okay that's how your user program will decide whether the interrupt to be processed or ignored at that time non maskable interrupt these are the most critical interrupt and this should not be ignored okay so they are much more important than the maskable interrupt for example power on reset external reset or some device fault these are the non maskable interrupt and the third is the inter processor interrupt here one processor may send send the interrupt to the other processor to bring its attention okay now next we will discuss how to configure the interrupt in the zinc soc so in the zinc soc architecture which we are studying there are wide range of the interrupt for example you can classify the interrupts into the three types the first type is software generated interrupt so these interrupts are generated by writing some uh, bits in the register of the each software so they are internally generated second are the shared peripheral interrupts these are generated from the peripheral as well as accelerator in the uh, pl also your peripheral can also generate the interrupt for the pl and these are the private peripheral interval these are the private to the each core of the processor for example there are timers are there there are uh, different counters are there which can generate the interrupt even pl can uh, generate the interrupt via ppi okay there are certain um, uh, uh, conditions are there through which the pl can generate the ppi interrupt for the particular processor okay so all there are so many interrupts are there which can be generated so all these interrupts are managed by the gic that is a general interrupt controller this gic general interrupt controller has the ability to enable the different interrupt disable the interrupt to classify the interrupt to distribute the interrupt to the appropriate cpu as well as to prioritize the interrupt so the interrupt can be generated by the many different unit sensor in the zinc soc all the interrupt sources are centralized by the interrupt distributor which is nothing but the gic before the one with the highest priority is dispatched to the individual cpu so cpu can process only one interrupt at a time so the gic will decide at a particular time which interrupt to be processed so here you can see that there are two types of interrupts are there one is the normal interrupt and the second is the fast interrupt that is the fiq the cpu can uh, process both the type of interrupt gic manages the interrupt that are sent to the cpus from the ps and the pl so all the interrupts will be managed by the gic gic is capable of enabling disabling masking the interrupt prioritize prior prioritizing the interrupt and sending them to the appropriate cpu in the program manner so one interrupt can be processed by the cpu 0 as well as cpu 1 so to whom it should be sent again it will be decided by the gic gic registers are accessed via the cpu private bus okay so as we know that the the cpu needs to have the frequent communication with the gic while processing the interrupt so there will be some status register 
as well as some control register inside the GIC so that the communication between the GIC and CPU can happen. Now, for the communication between the GIC and CPU, you can use the regular buses inside the processor. But since these buses might be used by the, some other peripherals, sometimes there will be a traffic on these buses or the bus may not be available. In that case, the communication between the CPU and the GIC get delayed. And this will also affect the interrupt latency. What is the interrupt latency? It is the time taken by the processor to process the particular interrupt. Now to minimize this interrupt latency, because interrupts are generated to the specific important event, so we need to process the interrupt as quickly as possible. So to minimize the interrupt latency, there is a private bus. Okay, these are the nothing but the register here. This is the private bus between the CPU and the GIC through which CPU can communicate with the GIC. GIC also ensures that the interrupts that target more than one CPU are can only be taken by the single CPU at a time. Now, to differentiate between the different sources of the interrupt, there is a unique interrupt ID given to the each interrupt source. And each interrupt source can be configured depending upon the type of the interrupt, priority of the interrupt, and which CPU it can be forwarded. Everything can be configured for every interrupt source. So in this lab, uh, we are going to use the same, uh, same block diagram as we did in the, our lab three. Okay. So in the lab three uh, block diagram, we are going to do a few changes. First thing is that uh, we are going to uh, add the interrupt. port on PS. So you can see that this is the interrupt port has been added. Then we are going to use the DMA interrupt So in the DMA interrupt, there are two interrupts. One is the MM2S. So this interrupt is generated when the DMA sends the data to the FFT and S2MM when the DMA receives the data and DMA stores the data in the ACP uh, memory via ACP port, these interrupts are generated. So we need to do the concatenation of those ones so that they be generated two bit signal. And this two bit signal is then passed to the interrupt out of the PS. So uh, these are the two things we need to take care. Of. And in case you have not done the third part, in case of the ACP one, you can enable the cache currency. This is not related to the interrupt, but this is what we have discussed in the last lab. So that by enabling the cache currency, you can remove the uh, need of the data flush and data a cache flush and the cache invalidate function, okay, which will help us to speed up the PL FFT operation. Okay, these are the changes we need to do. And in this lab, what are the things we are going to use? We are going to use this GIC. Then uh, we are going to use the core zero. We are going to use the DMA here. We are going to use the FFT here. Uh, we are going to use the ACP port. Uh, we are going to use the snoop control unit, L2 cache. Uh, then we are going to use the timer. We are going to use the UART and we are going to use the DDR. Okay, These are the things we are going to use in our today's lab. Of course, we are also going to use the debug one for the debugging of the code. Okay. So uh, this completes the introduction of the uh, interrupts as well as the what we are going to do in the today's lab. Now in the next video, we are going to discuss the how to configure the interrupt in the Zinc SOC.